Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail Critics, and of course, my Underwater Train Finders. You are the reason why this content remains! Play in favorites, and today, we're gonna talk about more railway company history. The whole story, from start to finish. And today I get to talk about my favorite railway ever. My favorite follow the flag railroad of all time. And that is, of course, Chicago and Northwestern. Maybe that wasn't of course, as this might be a bit of a surprise to some of you, as several of my favorite locomotives are not at all Chicago and Northwestern. But I think it has to do with nostalgia for me, because some of my earliest O-Gage toy trains were actually uh, Chicago and Northwestern when I was very little. And I've always been a bit fond of their livery and etc, etc. So let's discuss the history of Chicago and Northwestern. Now, Chicago Northwestern as a whole was technically born out of a merger, though its earliest predecessor would probably be the Galena and Chicago Union, which was chartered in 1836. That railroad is actually very notable, as it was Chicago's first railroad in general, but also the first one to operate a steam locomotive out of the city. Naturally, by the name, it was intended to connect Chicago and Galena, the cities, as well as reach the Mississippi River, but they had financial trouble pretty much from the get-go. Surveying was carried out to actually build the lines, but they never, well, actually built the lines. The project was stalled for 10 years until 1846 and was taken over by new ownership, who had the financial backing to actually complete the project. Ground was finally broken in June of 1848, and by January 22nd of 1850, 42 miles had been opened to Elgin. On October 10th that same year, a 420 that was named the Pioneer arrived by Schooner, and she was placed into service on October 24th, earning the distinction of being the first to operate out of Chicago. The gambit on the new line proved very successful because, well, Chicago wasn't as big as it is nowadays, obviously, but it was growing at the time, and a growing city is perfect for a rail line because, well, people need materials and food and other supplies, and a rail line, especially back then, was the best way to get those goods in and out of the city. And being the first, it means you technically have a monopoly on that, at least for a little while. So the new line proved instantly profitable. Agriculture was a big part of them. That area of the United States is known for farming, and suddenly farmers in the area could sell their goods in places that were hundreds of miles away without having to worry about the stuff being spoiled. Prior to trains, you couldn't get food that far without, well, losing it. It would go rotten. Trains could get it there faster and sell the stuff to consumers that otherwise would not have been able to purchase it from those suppliers. GNCU had reached Freeport by September of 1853, but they failed to reach Galena that year. Illinois Central actually arrived there first, and that forced GNCU to rely on an interchange connection with them. It was unfortunate, but it wasn't a major deal. They could still, in theory, reach the Mississippi, and that would be huge, since the Mississippi was a major lifeline into the central United States. A lot of goods were sailed up that river, and those goods could suddenly go much further out into the country, going by train. GNCU was aggressive when it came to expansion, and they had to be. There were a lot of competitors in that area, and if they didn't expand, their competitors would. By taking up as much land as they possibly could, it stopped their competitors from occupying that land in turn. They also leased some other railways, like the Chicago, Iowa, and Nebraska, and the Cedar Rapids and Missouri River Railroad and that meant they reached as far as Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Their ultimate goal was actually Omaha, which was the point which the Transcontinental Railroad, which is owned by Union Pacific, was to strike out westward. The line was completed in January of 1867, and they established a direct interchange with Union Pacific into Omaha after a bridge was opened over the Missouri River in 1872. That was huge for them, and such an interchange was insanely lucrative for both companies. But GNCU wasn't actually the direct ancestor of Chicago and Northwestern. They were just there first. The actual company that would really become Chicago and Northwestern, and effectively merge with GNCU, was the Chicago, St. Paul, and Fond du Lac Railroad. That railroad had been formed on March 31st, 1855, through a merger, actually, between the Illinois and Wisconsin, and the Rock River Valley Union Railroads, 
The two networks were all right, averagey at best. They were disconnected from networks at the time, so they really couldn't move goods and people outside of the general area. They also weren't connected to each other, which was really relevant since they were technically supposed to be merging. Of course, the immediate plan after the merger was to actually combine the networks, but those plans fell flat because they folded into bankruptcy before that was accomplished. The property was then acquired by a businessman named William Ogden, and he formed the Chicago and Northwestern Railway in June of 1859. Ogden was good really good at railroading, especially at a time when it was a very new thing. He had a solid business sense and knew exactly what needed to be done in order to get a line working and functioning properly. Algen had already been involved with the aforementioned GNCU and was largely responsible for their success. In fact, he was involved with a lot of different railroads as well as being a politician. He was smart, real smart, and he used that intellect mostly to better the area in and around Chicago. For a time, he was Chicago's wealthiest citizen, and he had earned that wealth through quick thinking and rational business practices. Chicago and Northwestern and GNCU were already interchange partners long before a merger was actually considered. Since Ogden already had a history with both of them anyway, it didn't really seem logical to keep them separate. They were so close. Why not combine their efforts into one large company? That merger was approved in 1865, and they kept the name Chicago and Northwestern, which effectively overnight became a system that was over 850 miles long, and one of the most important rail lines in the Midwest. Ogden himself remained with the company until the summer of 1868, and he was still largely responsible for the early success of the company, and he really understood the nature of his competitors, like the future Milwaukee Road, Burlington, and Rock Island. Because of their existence, they could easily render his railroad completely obsolete unless they were constantly expanding, getting new territories, something that his competitors just didn't have, and force them to interchange with him. His successors shared this vision for the Chicago and Northwestern, and expansion was fiercely aggressive. During the later 19th century, Chicago and Northwestern acquired a ton of smaller railroads to expand their ever-growing empire. Chicago and Milwaukee, Winona and St. Peter, Iowa Midland Railway, and Northwestern Union Railway all became a part of Chicago and Northwestern. During this period, they were a bit like the Borg for the Midwest. Resistance is futile. You will be assimilated. We will adapt your rail lines to suit our own. This resulted in a just stupid, stupid amount of branch lines. Just an insane amount of branch lines. But at that time anyway, that was a really good thing. Everything moved by rail, especially long distance. There was nothing else. There were no cars and there were no planes. So the more lines there were, the easier it was to get goods to where they needed to be. Most railways just couldn't afford to build this many branch lines, but Chicago and Northwestern just kind of absorbed them from people who had already built them by buying out other companies. By 1880, they maintained a 2,500 mile network, and by 1890, that became 4,200 miles. Their territory had ballooned in size to an insane degree, but frankly it was because they were good at what they were doing. They moved the freight and people successfully. Citizens liked them. Their prices were, for the time, reasonable. So their growth and success was certainly earned. During their final years of expansion, they also acquired Chicago, St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Omaha Railway, as well as Fremont, Elkhorn, and Missouri Valley Railroad. Through this aggressive expansion, they naturally wanted eventually to reach the West Coast, but they never made it beyond Lander, Wyoming. It was just too much for them. That area had already been built up and taken over by other railways, like Union Pacific, so they just couldn't reach quite that far. But they still had solid space to make money, and they were bordering the Great Lakes, one of the most economically important sections of the United States. It wasn't like they weren't in a position to make money anyway, regardless of whether they could reach the Pacific or not. And they'd already crossed the Mississippi years ago. So, you know, they were fine. During the early 1900s, they were basically just stuck. They couldn't really expand easily. So they were just maintaining 7,450 miles of network. And a lot of that was their thick nest of branch lines. Some of those lines were less than 10 miles apart, which in a perfect world would seem radically unnecessary, and it kind of was, but they hadn't actually built those lines technically. They had bought them. They just never bothered to tear them up, because why? Occasionally, they would use them. 
And as growth slowed, they put the money exactly where it needed to go, upgrading and maintenance. They wanted to build up the lines themselves to make them capable of handling heavier and longer trains. They double tracked some areas to make it easier to get trains through, and they added new signal systems to make things run more efficiently. This is precisely what a railroad needs to do if they can't expand. If you can't expand your line and you have nothing else to do, instead of lining your pockets, no, reinvest it in the lines. Make sure they're functioning to full capacity because you will never have a problem in the long run if you make sure those lines are at peak efficiency at all times. At least until the late 20s, it went really well. The quality of Chicago and Northwestern's lines in that time just couldn't be beaten. They were good at management, they were good at efficiency, they were good at not having derailments. They were a phenomenal railroad, and then things got depressing. The Great Depression. Yeah, it's a story we've heard often enough when it comes to these fallen flag railroads, and I mean, there's a good reason for that. It was a terrible, horrible economic disaster. Many companies folded or entered bankruptcy, and the railroads suffered greatly during that time. Every single one of them had some struggle to overcome, some less than others. And in Chicago and Northwestern's case, well, it was taxing on them. It was pretty bad. Yeah, they were in a very economically viable area. They had a better go at it than most, but by January 27th, 1935, they had run out of money and entered bankruptcy, not emerging until entering the economic boom caused by World War II and becoming stable again on June 1st, 1944. That's actually a pretty good run though. I mean, they exited bankruptcy during the war. World War II hadn't even ended at that point. Most railroads that had entered bankruptcy during the depression didn't leave it till after the war was over. Not Chicago and Northwestern though. During the bankruptcy years, things kept being developed on the rail line in particular Streamliners. Streamliners were a big deal during that time. People liked the look of them, they were fancy, and they were advertised as being fast. Chicago and Northwestern, of course, had to throw their hat in the ring for the passenger service. I mean, duh. Even Milwaukee Road had with their Hiawathas. So Chicago and Northwestern created the 400, which was their Chicago to Twin Cities route that was roughly 400 miles and was intended, scheduled anyway, to take 400 minutes. Hence, 400. But originally, that line actually wasn't streamlined. They simply didn't have the money for it at the time. But they did have the money to modernize some old Pacifics of theirs, which were E2As. They wanted to increase their speed, so they were rebuilt as oil burners, given larger driving wheels, and carried bigger tenders to improve range. Even though originally not streamlined, the 400 proved very successful in the 30s, and in 1939, they received some EMD E3s, which were, of course, the streamlined bulldog-nosed diesels that you might be familiar with when it comes to American railroad history. Those took over operations of the 400 from then on, and with the new streamlining look, well, it made it even more of a success, especially during the World War II boom. The 400 wasn't Chicago and Northwestern's official first introduction to streamlining, but it was their most famous, and a fleet of the 400s was actually unveiled across the Midwest. As the post-war years ticked by, steam was of course phased out as the railway began to dieselize. Chicago and Northwestern retired their last steam locomotive by 1956, but given the time period, you may notice that this is when railways were starting to struggle. Again, cars and planes were in the mix now. They had new competition that was outside of just each other, and it was difficult for a lot of railways to get by. Their revenue ton miles dropped by one billion in just seven years between 1946 and 1953, though, to be fair, a part of that may have been attributable to World War II being over. Still, it was an issue, and they had a really overbuilt network. By that time, it was 9,400 miles. And they begin to do the one thing that I just feel like, personally, this is just me, a railway should never risk doing. They deferred maintenance. No. The problem with deferred maintenance is this, because I've brought it up before. A lot of other railways that were struggling did it. But this kind of tactic never works in the long term, ever. It will get you by maybe a few months or so. But once those lines start to literally deteriorate, and I mean fall apart, you're gonna have derailments, and derailments are a lot more expensive than just fixing the tracks. So unless your plan is just defer maintenance for a month or two, how about this? Don't do it. Save money anywhere else, but do not let your tracks go to waste. They're literally your lifeline, your bloodstream. You need those in order to operate as a railway. You cannot let them fall apart. During the mid-50s, it got so bad in this regard for Chicago and Northwestern 
that Union Pacific, who had been a solid partner of theirs for many years, switched their Chicago connection for their passenger services to Milwaukee Road of all people. And Milwaukee Road deferred maintenance like crazy too, but Chicago and Northwestern was that bad at this time that UP just said the heck with it. In 1963, Chicago and Northwestern discontinued the Twin Cities 400, and the 400 name disappeared entirely by 1969. Though that was probably due to people just not using trains for passenger service that much anymore. However, they were blessed, thankfully, with a good president during this time, Ben Heinemann. Many of his decisions did help improve the situation, even when the company was struggling. In 1956, they reported losses of more than $5 million. But in two years, the railroad was again showing a profit. Heinemann was very logical in his approach to things, and knew how to get the railway back on track, so to speak. And that's not a pun, that's just how I say it, okay? Everyone thinks I do that on purpose. I don't. But, hey, if it made you laugh, good. Solid work. However, there was one problem that Heinemann couldn't really solve, and that was the overwhelming amount of branch lines. Like I said before, multiple times during this video actually, Chicago and Northwestern's network had a ton of oversaturated branch lines, many of whom, frankly by this point, just needed to go. They needed to get out of there. They didn't need them, they were a waste of money to maintain them, and they just weren't using them. But, unfortunately, the ICC existed, and they existed to be as irritating as possible. See, in addition to having to approve any kind of merger between rail lines, the ICC also had to approve abandoning excess capacity, which a lot of rail lines needed to do. But it was nearly impossible to convince the ICC that this needed to be done. Anytime the ICC heard tearing up tracks, they were like, no, don't do that, that's bad. Don't ever do that. Leave those tracks there, you need them. Even when they really didn't, and it was wasting company money. Heinemann actually magnified the issue in a way by acquiring a series of smaller systems, beginning with the Lynchfield and Madison in 1958. Then in 1960, he acquired the Minneapolis and St. Louis Railway. Then again in 1968, they picked up the Chicago Great Western. But all this acquisition turned Chicago and Northwestern into a network that was over 11,500 miles. And only Lynchfield and Madison and the Great Western offered markets the railroad didn't already have. So why did you get them? Chicago Northwestern was also uniquely stubborn about a very specific thing, and that's retiring their rolling stock. They did not like getting rid of their diesels at all. Many of their diesels lasted well beyond their service lives, and that was on purpose. They just didn't like getting rid of their old stuff. It earned them the insulting nickname, Cheap and Nothing Wasted, but this was actually beneficial to the railroad for a few reasons, and they had a system behind this that made it wildly efficient. See, for one thing, they didn't have to buy that many new diesels. They could just keep using the old ones. Which is super relevant, because new rolling stock is expensive. It's a cost sink. And to be fair, as long as you're maintaining the old stuff and it's not too expensive to maintain, in theory, it's cheaper to wait to get newer stuff at a discounted rate. Plus, it was really good for rail fans because Chicago and Northwestern was one of the last places in America where you could see really old EMDs. Locomotives that pretty much every other line in America had long retired by that point, Chicago and Northwestern still used in regular service. And the way they did this was actually quite clever. See, Chicago and Northwestern also had the unique attribute of purchasing from pretty much every major diesel manufacturer in America, so they had a lot of different types. Because of the size of the railroad, they assigned the diesels to different blocks, basically different areas of the network, based on manufacturer. And this was very relevant for maintenance. It meant that all the Alcos were working in one area of the railway. All the EMDs were in one, all the Baldwins were in one, and so on. And because of this, the maintenance crews assigned to every area knew how to deal with the particular quirks of each different manufacturer. Plus, while the manufacturers between each other weren't necessarily compatible via parts, their diesel types underneath each manufacturer umbrella could often swap parts if necessary. This streamlined maintenance greatly and extended the life of a variety of different diesels. There was actually a particular line from Winona, Minnesota to Rapid City, South Dakota, that in the 1970s was called the Alco Line, because that was the area where Chicago and Northwestern ran their Alco diesels, the ones they still had left and were continuing to use. Despite generally trying to make good decisions, some bad ones, some good ones, they still had the benefit of being in a very good economic area. Food still needed to be moved around in the Midwest, and they were still bordering the Great Lakes, 
but they were still discussing the idea of merging. In this case, it was with Milwaukee Road. The subject had actually come up as early as the 30s, but it was never seriously considered back then. In the 60s it was, but the deal completely fell through thanks to the ICC, who forced terms upon both railways that, while Milwaukee Road was down for, Chicago and Northwestern was absolutely not. And in retrospect, based on what happened to Milwaukee Road, it may have been a really good decision on Chicago and Northwestern's part not to inherit that bag of nonsense. During the same time, Chicago and Northwestern formed a new subsidiary that was known as Northwest Industries. This seems like a bizarre decision, but at the time, it was actually a very smart one and a lot of railways were doing this. It was a paper corporation. It didn't really need to exist on its own, technically, but because of the ICC, it did. The reason is that Northwest Industries was responsible for acquiring and profiting from companies that were outside of railroading. Because of that, they had no ICC oversight, which they would if they still did this under Chicago and Northwestern. But because this was now a shell company, ICC had no say in what they did, and they were free to invest in other areas of the economic market in order to generate some cash flow to deal with the struggling rail situation. But Northwest Industries did really well. It was a very successful endeavor, so much so that the suits over there actually wanted completely out of the railway business. They wanted nothing to do with it anymore. It was high cost and low profit. It was difficult, especially during those days. And with ICC oversight, it was even worse. They would rather cut their losses on it and focus on other areas where they could generate more money, but what were they gonna do? Would they just sell the company to another competitor? Would they keep making bad decisions, let it flounder, line their own pockets as a result of bankruptcy and then run for the hills? Yeah, they could do that, but they had a better idea because they weren't necessarily bad people. Yeah, they were looking to get out of the railway business, but they knew that they had a lot of employees that depended on them. It wasn't like this was a small network. It boasted thousands, tens of thousands of people working for it in order to keep the lines running, and those people needed jobs. They needed to work. So what were they gonna do? They wanted to get out of the business, but they didn't want to abandon people that depended on them. Well, the only logical conclusion was of course to become filthy communists. Welcome to the republics of the Chicago of Soviet Socialist Railways. We will get your freight to where the people are, for we are the people. Comrades. Okay, maybe calling it communist is a little bit of an exaggeration, but on June 1st, 1972, the suits, the higher-ups, sold the company to the employees. The people who actually worked in the company now owned it. Everyone had a share, and therefore had some level of input as to how things could be run. Many of these were grizzled veterans who knew how rail lines ran and knew what was best for them, and that was very important to their future success, as well as decision-making practices. And the whole thing was finalized on June 1st, 1972, with the suits going off with NWI to do NWI things, and the employees of Chicago and Northwestern continuing to run the railway. The first thing they did after this was get rid of those blasted branch lines. They didn't need this many of them. It was out of control and they knew it. They knew it for a long time and they wanted someone to do something about it, but nobody had. But now the employees were in charge and they could see the problem because they had lived it. They were there. They were on the ground doing the work and they began to sell or completely abandon thousands of miles of light density lines, which increased their earnings and they pushed to lower their outrageously disgustingly high operating ratio, which was about 90%. The company also started upgrading their most important routes as they wanted to enter Wyoming's growing Powder River Basin coal seams, which were really important at that time and very sought after. It would have been a financial boon for them but the problem they had was that they owned a line that actually went there already, the Cowboy Line. But that corridor had been severely neglected over the years. It would never be able to handle the amount of weight these trains would have, ever. And it would also be too expensive to fix by that point. They would pretty much have to replace the whole thing. So they handled it logistically by making friends with their old ally, Union Pacific. They worked with them to build a new connector from Union Pacific to the western end of the Cowboy Line. The coal that was coming down from there became very important for them, and the railroads began to work very close together, repeatedly over the years. By 1994, they had reduced their network back down to 4,323 miles. It's sad to see such a massive railway shrink, but remember that most of those miles were unnecessary branches that just didn't go anywhere, didn't do anything for them. So of course they got rid of them, 
they didn't need to pay to maintain them anymore. But Chicago and Northwestern over time had become impressive to Union Pacific. They had worked well together and continued to do so into 1995. But they were so close together that UP began to eye them as a completely necessary component of their own operations. They needed Chicago and Northwestern and they figured they would need them for a good long while. Rather than let them stay independent, why not offer to buy them outright? That's exactly what Union Pacific did, acquiring control of Chicago and Northwestern in April 1995. That closed the chapter on the once great Chicago and Northwestern. A sad end to see it go, but you have to remember, they pulled through. Technically speaking, they were a success. There were good times, yeah, but there were also plenty of hard times. And in many of those hard times, they could have went under or just given up. But they never did, even allowing their own employees to control and run the company. And they did it, and it was ultimately their decision that allowed Union Pacific to take over and control the network. That being said, Union Pacific does pay homage to this fallen flag in the form of an EMD SD70 ACE that's numbered 1995, painted in a version of the famous green and yellow livery that Chicago and Northwestern was known for. I'll miss you, Chicago and Northwestern, but you are not forgotten. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Some dude 267, Orange Glass, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoth 444, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitson 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, DM Trouble Typhoon, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Joshua Long, Alaric Jaspers, Brian, Jack Carson's Rare Videos, Major Klutz, Hayden DeGrow, Master of None, Dr. Racer 78, Crystal Morgan, and Ohio Trucker 1. Till next time. This is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.